So let's say that we're gonna make something bounce on a, a triangle, kind of like we had before, right? Now you guys are doing five jumps of any kind. Hopefully it has a really good story. So let's say we have our box here. And we talked about how we set these things up properly, right? So we're gonna hit D. That's gonna pull up our universal manipulator and allow us to move our pivot point. I'm gonna hold V, which is snap to vertex. Yank that down, hit D one more time to accept its new position. Then I'm gonna hold X and just pull this up, snap to grid. So now my box is sitting on the ground, right? If I add a plane in, crank this thing out real nice. I don't need all those subdivisions. All right, and I don't need that. Now, you might say, well, now I can't see anything. That's my intention. See, this way, if I mess up, you don't know. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, if you guys want to see some color in your scene, I'm just going to show you this really quickly. This is not something you have to do, but it, it does make your scene a little more appealing. You can come in, right click on an object, scroll down, to where it says add new material or add favorite material. Either one of those will work. If I do add new material, it's gonna bring up this guy. I would tell you to select either a Blinn or a Lambert at this particular moment. I'm gonna do, so the difference between a Blinn and a Lambert, a Blinn has specularity, so it's shiny-ish, has levels of shine. A Lambert, is matte, all right? So, if it doesn't matter if it shines, you might as well go with matte if it's easier on your processor. So let's say that I make these balls or these boxes kind of a dark color of some kind. You can click on this and play around with whatever color that might be. And we want it to be kind of a, it's pretty putrid. There. That's a something. All right. So we've got this dirty old box. Let's get a couple of those. Before I drag out more, I'm going to name this box 01. I'm gonna name this ground a one. Remember, always number, <clears throat> even if you're only gonna have one of these things in your scene, number them. Because you never know if you're gonna eventually make a copy, right? And if you've made that copy, then it's gonna, you're gonna have, in this case, ground, just ground, and then ground one is your second one, which you don't want, right? It throws the whole thing off. So just Save yourself that frustration. So if I want to make copies of this guy, I can hit Control D. Control D is duplicate, and then it automatically selects the duplicate. And I can draw, draw drag this guy out a little bit like so. Control D again, and there we go. I'm just gonna look at this from the top real fast and check out my scene. All right. Oops. So I've got my three boxes and I need a ball to bounce. This guy a little bit bigger, kind of like a beach ball maybe. Now where do we want this uh, pivot point? At the bottom. At the bottom, correct. 
So I flip over to my translate tool, which is W. I hit D to move the pivot point. This is the universal manipulator right here. I hold V. Notice when I hold V, this center square turns to a circle. Also, up here at the top, this blue dot or blue box pops open, which tells me that it's gonna snap to a vertex. I grab it in the Y axis only, pull straight down, and then hit D again to accept the new location. Hold X, snap it to my grid. All right, now, before I start freezing transformations and anything, I'm going to want to get this guy to wherever the starting location is. That way, I don't have to freeze the transformations again. It's just going to save me a click. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter. Just remember to save or to freeze those transformations after you move it to its new location. All right. So we've got our ball roughly in place. That looks like a thing right there. I'm gonna go ahead and give this material as well. Sign a new material. Let's make it a shiny ball. So we'll make it red and a blend. I'll lower this value just a little bit. All right. I've got a shiny red ball. You can play around if you want with varying sizes of these things, however you want to go about it. Give yourself some sort of story. Differentiate them a bit. That's up to you. You can add in ramps and hoops and all the things. It's essentially going to be the same process. All right, once I have everything here, oh, almost forgot to name my ball. Ball 01. There we go. Now I'm done. I'm going to highlight everything. I'm gonna freeze my transformations and then delete my history. So this is now ready to animate, all right? Now, I've already added in my graph editor and my dope sheet right here. That way I don't have to go back up and access those, but in case we miss that, remember that we find our graph editor and dope sheet in Windows animation editors, and you have the graph editor here, and the dope sheet right here, all right? Now when those open, I just grab them and I drag them right down into the timeline, um, snap them down here so that they're part of my user interface permanently. Oh, all right. So before I start animating anything, before I set a single keyframe, what do I need to remember to do for this animation? What information do I need to know before I animate? Uh, number of frames. Yeah, 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 yeah. Number of frames, frames per minute or second. <laughs> well, if you know how many per second, then you know how many per minute. So frames per second, very important. Now, I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna, so shift this over to 30 frames per second. Now I want you to see something that happened right here. What's this first frame? First frame right now is 1.25. It was on one. Also notice that it flipped our end frame to 150 instead of 120. If you start right here, your first, if you just start setting your keyframe, your first keyframe is going to be on 1.25, which is not what you want, obviously, right? So make sure when you flip that over to 30, you come back in here and you reset that thing back to where it 
it needs to be, and then kick that guy back down to one. So you just want to rewind it. All right. <clears throat> 150 keyframes probably is more than enough. So from here, I'm gonna come over to the channel box and I'm gonna set a keyframe. This is my first keyframe. All right. Now assuming, let me see. I need to go once, twice, three times if each one of those is 30 keyframes. I should be able to get away with 120 keyframes without any real issue. So what I'm gonna do is come over here to 120, and I'm gonna set another keyframe. So I clicked on the right thing. Okay, so we now have a looping animation set up. Why, why is it looping? Because it's in the same position for the start of the keyframe as the end of the keyframe. Correct, correct. So if it needs to loop before you do anything in the center, make sure you're nailing that first and last keyframe. It's just going to save you a ton of time and frustration. All right. So we've got that guy, I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna nail down all the key locations that my ball has to travel to, all right? So I know it has to come somewhere over here, has to come over here, and then it has to return back to here at 120, all right? So what I'm going to come over here to keyframe 30. I'm gonna move this ball. Let's move it like this. This thing's gonna basically bounce in a circle. It's gonna be weird, but whatever. Maybe there's a cyclonic wind in here. So this is my first keyframe, then I move it to 60. Cover here, that looks like a good spot. Come to 90. jump over here, kind of crazy. Set that keyframe, and then it's just gonna roll itself back over. All right, and we can play with uh, the in-betweens later. So if we come in, I watch real fast. Nice, okay. So it's doing what we want it to do so far. I would recommend that every time you guys set some keyframes, a small group of keyframes, play that group of keyframes that you just set, make sure it's doing what you think it's supposed to do, and then roll on, all right? You don't want to get 15, 20 set keys down the line and then realize, oops, somewhere in here I messed up. I don't really know where. Right, and that's, it gets more important as we go on to more complicated animations, obviously. All right, so now we have the bases. Now I wanna get it to jump over top of these boxes, right? So I need to find a happy medium location. So I'm gonna come to 15 because I want this to actually jump over top of this dude. I'm gonna come here. And lift it up, all right? So I'm gonna set that keyframe. Maybe I wanna lift it a little bit more, there we go. Set that keyframe, then I'm gonna to move to 45. Move it right over top of this guy, and we'll 
we put it up. I'm gonna set that keyframe. Move it to 75. Lift that guy up. Move it over just a wee bit. We have a jump kind of like that. Set that keyframe. Now, if I want to just scrub through my timeline slowly, I can come in here. I'm left clicking inside the timeline. And I'm just dragging that back and forth, right? To kind of get a feel for the timing and the location of things. All right. So I'm going to have this guy kind of hitch out this way. So he jumps in from there. Yeah, I think I'm going to give this guy like two keyframes. So he like does this jump, comes out, rolls back in, and then goes for it again. Just for something to do, right? All right. So we just come in here, I'm gonna find two little locations. I got 30 keyframes to work with. So I'm gonna get this first one. I'm gonna pull him this way, let's see. He lands right here. So at 100, I'm gonna pull this guy out to like here. Set that keyframe at 110. Let's see, he rolls in. That angle. So I think I'm going to pull him in like there. All right. So it kind of wiggles itself back into alignment. It's kind of fun. All right. Any questions so far? I mean, super basic. It's just hitting S and moving a thing. Biggest thing that I see in the very beginning at this kind of uh, stage of animation is just people forgetting that you have to select the keyframe before you select the movement of the ball, right? If you move the ball and then select the keyframe, it's going to shoot itself back to where it was. So always keyframe first or select the keyframe, then move the ball, then hit S to save that keyframe. All right. So now that we have some of the main motion down, I'm going to start honing in on a single jump, right? And basically, whatever we do for that jump, we'll have to go back and start repeating that pattern on all the next jumps, all right? So we're going to come in here. We're going to look at this first dude, which happens between 1 and 30, all right? So how do we isolate a single jump? The bottom the gray slider. Yeah, the gray slider, right? So I'm going to come in here. I know it happens between 1 and 30. So I'm just going to grab this dude, squeeze it down. Boom, 30. So now if I come over here and I hit play, I'm only getting this one dude. Pretty nice. And we're defying all physics here. All right. So we got that going on. Now we want to start coming in and doing those tweens. Right, so we talked about all this out as we can. We talked about the ball starts and stops here and has a dude up here at the very peak. This is currently where we're at. We haven't added any actual calculations in the scale, only translation. Right? So what we want is to start off in this squash at the base, come to 
our zero, zero, zero ball midway in that jump. At the peak, we want to have the base lift up just a little bit, like he's lifting his legs. This guy's still going to have a little squash when it lands. And there's going to have to be a reach in between the zero, zero and the squash, all right? So this guy here is going to have scale plus rotation. We'll add the rotation in after we do the scale for those guys. And this guy will just have scale and two bases, the landing and takeoff will have scale. All right, piece of cake. Now what's the other thing that we talked about which is rather important when we're dealing with our scales, especially. Uh, maintaining the same mass. Yes, mass. What's the calculation that we need? The grand total. Uh, for this is three. So yes. It should always be three because you're going to freeze your transformations before you start. But once you froze your transformations, your scale will return to one, one, one. Okay. All right. Yeah. So. If it's not that, then somebody has something on the summer on the way. Yeah. <laughs> Go back, restart. Okay, so we need to make sure that we maintain that scale of three. One, one, one is three. Let's make sure that is Y and Z. So whatever we do inside of here, these all end up at three. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're first going to add in these guys, all right? The zero, zero, zero between guys. And I'm just using really easy math here. So I'm just splitting differences, right? If, if I know I've got 15 frames here, all I'm doing right now is coming back to either seven or eight for the first bit. Let's say I go to eight, just so I have one extra frame to squash things. Still uh, at zero, 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 or one, one, one. It's not zero, 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 technically it's one, one, one. I'm still at my normal uh, guy, so I'm gonna hit S here, and then find my middle bit here, say 22 and hit S, all right? Nothing crazy going on there. Now, what I can do is start adding my calculations to the squash base and the squash at the top, right? So I can get a little bit of that bounce in there. So let's start at the top. If I want this guy to pull his feet up a little bit, maybe I come in here and I say 0.8, for the Y, which would give us X and Z have to be what? Three, so 1.1? 1. 1. Yes, yes, 1.1. Right. Boom. Okay, hit enter, reselect my ball, and hit S. All right, so now, Wind. I've got a little bit of squash at the top, which feels like he's pulling his legs up to make it over top of that thing, right? All right. Next thing we do, make sure you have your ball selected, otherwise not much is gonna happen. I'm gonna add that base squash, right? So it has a little bit of lift off and a little bit of landing. Now, because I tend to think that there's a lot more force in lifting off and in landing, I crank up that squash at the beginning and at the end, all right? So what do we want to try for why? There's really no wrong answer. Maybe a uh, point six or seven. 
Yeah, let's try 0 0.6. That'll make math easy. So if we're doing 0.6 for y, x and z become 1.2. All right. And grab that guy. So we're at the base. I'm going to set that dude. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to do the same thing. 1.2, 0 0.6, 1.2, enter, boom, reselect my ball, and S. All right, rewind and play. I'm going to deselect as well. So we're already starting to get kind of a rubbery feel, right? Now, clearly, something is a little weird about it right? Because it's just like this strange bouncy disc floating through the sky. It's not really trying to reach towards anything. So we have to add that in. All right. <clears throat> this is actually where a lot of students go, okay, I think this is close enough. And they turn it in, which obviously isn't going to get a very good grade. So I would urge you to continue pushing. So now we want to split the difference again, right? So if we're going to do that uh, reaching ball, we have eight frames here. So let's say that we <clears throat> come to four. That sounds good. I'm going to take this guy. I'm going to essentially invert what I did before. So. <clears throat> I'm going to scale both of these guys, the X and the Z, the opposite direction. So when we're here, we're at 0.6. So I'm going to come in at frame four. Let's say 0 0.8, 0 0.8. And then this has to be 1.4. All right, <clears throat> so we reselect this guy, set that keyframe. I'm gonna come over and give myself four frames over here and do the same thing. 0.8, tab, 1.4, tab, 0.8. And set my keyframe. Rewind. So right now, it looks a little strange because it's not aiming yet, right? It's reaching, but it's not reaching towards the right area. It's just reaching straight up. So it's hoping that that uh, vortex wind is just gonna jump. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you old double jump. Classic. I remember being a really nitpicky kid when I was young, and I always thought it was a really cool move, but I was like, what's he jumping off of? Right. You know, does he have boosters in his shoes? Like, I, I needed an explanation. He's just throwing his feet so hard towards the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Causes a disruption of yes. air that reverberates back up. Yes, and pushes him. Pushes him, time. yeah. Clearly. Yeah, come on, kid. What are you, what are you doing with yourself? Everybody knows this. All right, so. <laughs> Okay, so we have that. The next thing we wanna do is add in our aim, all right? Now, there's a fancy tool that actually allows us to see whether or not we're getting our aim right, right? We come over here to the top left corner where it says modeling. These are our modes, all right? So if I come down here to my animation mode, it gives me an entire different list. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it gives me an entire different list. So I can come over here and see things like different playbacks, um, set key settings, deforms, constraints, all kinds of goodies. What I'm looking for is the visualize menu. And I'm going to come down here where it says ghost selected. So 
it's going to create ghosts of this ball before and after the ball. So it's going to show you where this thing is going each frame, essentially, which is kind of cool. So I can come in, hit Ghost Selected, and now it's going to give me previews of where this ball is going throughout time, before and after that jump. <clears throat> now, if we need a different setting here, like to spread these ghosts out or have more of them, we can come back in here and you'll notice that there's a little box at the end of a large number of these tools. That's our options box. If we select the box itself, it's gonna pull up our options window. And then we can come in and do custom frames or custom key steps. So I'm gonna select custom key steps. And let's say I want steps, uh, maybe I want four before and four after, right? So I hit apply. And now it's going way before, right? So that's, it's choosing frame one, frame four, frame eight, right? So it's giving me a huge jump. If I come into frame steps, that's a different way of looking at it. So instead of having a four gap. Now it's actually giving me four frames and then four frames, right? So you want to make sure you're clicking on the right dudes here. Key steps versus frame steps, huge difference, but still both uh, quite valuable depending on what you're doing. All right. So let's go with this. <clears throat> when you're done, you can close it. Now you'll notice that there, before I close this, there's apply and there's ghost, right? Both of those will apply that command or these settings to your selected object. The difference is if I hit ghost, it'll also close the window. If I'm test driving my settings here, maybe I, I want one more after, right? So I actually want five. By hitting apply, I get to see my results, but I'm test driving without going back in my menu over and over and over again. Cool? Yeah. Super handy. One of those things that should be obvious, kind of, but it wasn't explained to me when I first started Maya. So uh, I just ended up hitting apply and going, oh wow, that's pretty handy. So now I can see where this dude is going. Right? So this allows me to start to aim my ball <clears throat> and get an idea of how it's going to look in that animation. Right? So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to take a look at this dude. I'm going to add some rotation. And I'm essentially aiming it towards my one, one, one ball, this guy right here. All right. And then I'm gonna hit my set key. And notice it changed all of those ghosts. Right. And if we want to get rid of ghosting, you can also come over here, by the way, to your animation tab. You notice right here, we have ghosting, no ghosting. All right. We also have motion trails, which are kind of neat, but we're not going to deal with those right now. So I'm just going to turn my ghosting off. And then so the timing is a little bit off but at least it's aiming itself now towards its target right so now we have to do the inverse <clears throat> select our ball 
turn our ghosting back on, come down here to 26. So now what we'll want to do is aim our bottom towards the landing. And this will likely require translations and stuff as well, but we'll get to that here in a second when we start fine tuning. It's not that on that axis. Okay. Let's set that. Now this is going to be in the wrong location because right now it's swooping down. You see how it's doing that? We're actually going to fix that in the graph editor. So we're going to end up taking the base of this guy and moving it over to be the base of the landing. That way it lands right on that center point and kind of settles into place instead of scooting itself across the ground in place, which is not what we want, obviously. So. Some of these things, you could fix it here. You could translate this thing up and over to get it into the location you want. Personally, I like to do the vast majority of that in Graph Editor. Just get the basic keyframes down and know that you can fix it later. All right, it's gonna save you some headaches, I think, later on. So like I said, we've got that. I'm gonna turn ghosting off. Rewind. You can see it's a little wonky right there. The liftoff isn't bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. Okay. So now, if we're happy, and we'll say that we're happy, we would wanna go on to the next guy, right? I'm just gonna do quickly, up to 45, basically to get to the peak of the next one. That way we have a lift off, a landing, and a next bounce. Everything after that is basically the same stuff, rinse and repeat over and over again, all right? So now, we select our ball. It needs to jump from here up to here, all right? So let me go ahead and move this guy up to 30. I'm gonna give it a couple frames before just so it's not so crazy. Okay. So split the difference between 30 and 45. So we'll say 38. So you notice because we added the squash to this guy at that base, now it's still flying kind of like a pancake to get to the top, right? So we're going to have to add in the old spam calls. We're going to have to add in this 111. If you have multiples, uh, multiple settings here that you want to change at the same time, you can highlight all of them and type your calculation into just the bottom frame and hit enter and it'll change all three at the same time. It's pretty handy. Set that keyframe. All right. Come into 45. We're going to add that little bit where it's pulling its legs up. Okay. Then we need to come back here and split the difference here again. So we're going to add in our aim at 34. Let's see real fast. 
jumps. Let's come up to here. So this is actually our aim or reach. So we split this difference. We say 0.8. Point four and point eight. Set that guy. And then we can add some ghosting if we choose. Rotate this guy a little bit. That's good for now. Gonna be interesting. It's gonna warp himself around this corner. Turn my ghosting off. Rewind. Questions so far? No, beautiful. So from here, we come into our graph editor, all right? Or our dope sheet. If I would use the dope sheet if I felt like um, my frames were too far apart, there wasn't enough spacing, or they were, you know, wh whatever the deal was, I needed to either scale frames in to speed an area up, or I needed to uh, widen out some frames, scale them out in order to slow them down, all right? Right now, I don't feel too bad about the locations of these things. So inside of our graph editor, let me go ahead and crank this up just a wee bit. We move around in here, just the same as we do with our pan. So it's still all middle mouse and drag. That was the other thing that happened the uh, other day. My middle mouse went out mid video. That was pretty fun. So I had to come down here and steal a mouse. That was cool. Okay. So we come down here, middle mouse with alt. We can drag this around. We can use our zoom with the right click or we can use middle uh, mouse wheel to scroll in and out. We can also select groups of keyframes. So each one of these uh, little diamonds, these orange diamonds, if you're colorblind, they might not look orange, but it's a diamond shape right here. Those are your keyframes. And then each of these are referred to as splines. And then we have tangents, um, which is basically your handles here, right? Okay, so we can select groups and hit F, and that'll frame or focus you in on that particular area. It's a really fast way to dive back and forth inside of that graph editor. All right, a few other things to note. Let's go scrub through this beginning. So I'm going to take this guy and limit our viewable animation down to the first 15 frames. So all we want to see is that jump. Stop that come into my little running guy. So remember I said there may be a time where you want to slow down the playback to 0.5. This might be that time, right? Because we've only got 15 frames, so I'm literally looking at half a second worth of animation. So unless you can slow down time inside your head, I would suggest using the computer. So let's come down here. Do 0.5, 
I'll save that and kick out of there. So this will allow me to see a little easier, right? I'm stretching that out to about a second's worth. So the first thing I want to look at, well, there's several issues with this particular dude. If I'm looking at my bounce here, and if you want, you can also use ghosting for this. This will help you see the overall, overall arc. So there's a few oddities going on here. First of all, my ball starts, let me move back a few frames. It starts to get this weird swoop, right? And it leaps, when it starts to leap, the base of my ball leaves the ground mid-leap, right? So it ends up acting more like a torpedo than something jumping, right? So we want to start to look at its translations. So if I look over here on the left-hand side, I can see all of my channels rotate, translates, and scales, right? So what channels are going to be controlling the current location of the base of that object? Yes. So most importantly at this stage, we want to look at probably X and Z. That way we can get it kind of over top of where it was. So it basically its feet are planted, right? So if I jump, I don't start to fly in a direction as I aim myself, right? I would plant myself and then lean. And then as I leap left, my feet stay in the same spot until I leave the floor. Does that make sense? So that's what we want to get from our ball. We want that pivot point basically to stay in the same spot in the X and Y until, boom, it flips off. So we want to take these guys right here. I want to grab this. I can move this back towards its origin. You see how it's moving that right there inside the screen? So that's one little adjustment. Then we can play with the Y as well. So we could have this guy right here. We could bring it down a wee bit. We don't want it to poke through the floor too much. At that speed, honestly, you're not going to notice a whole lot, but it is something you want to be conscious of, right? So I'm kind of bringing it down, making sure it's still generally touching the floor, but not poking through too much. I've got about a pixel's width, but that'll all come out in the wash. Yeah. See how much smoother that looks? Now you can see it lean, push itself forward, and then yank its feet. Like it unglues itself from the ground. Okay. Now, what other oddities do we have here? Let's come around the side a little bit. What about the fact that this thing's traveling kind of like a rocket, almost a perfectly straight line going up? It doesn't have a very nice arc, right? 
Now, not everything in the world has a perfect arc, but for a bouncy ball, I'm going to guess it's going to have a pretty nice one. So we can come in and change some of the locations here. So I'll pause that. Can't rotate inside my graph editor. So I'm going to look at this dude. And I feel like it's not getting enough air in order to get that nice arc, right? So what I'm gonna do is come down here to frame eight, which is our one, one, one ball. And I'm gonna adjust it probably forward in time just a little bit, but definitely up in location. can also move this guy forward. But notice what happens. Notice that it created a new keyframe at nine, but still has one for eight. So what that did is it said, oh, I need to make a new keyframe at frame nine, but only for translate Y, right? You see that? So, I would tell you, yes, that's acceptable if you absolutely need it, but I would say it's better to go to your dope sheet, find this guy, and just move this whole dude forward. Now, you're gonna wanna select the ball, not translate Y. That way it moves all of your translate Y stuff forward, right? So now I can come in here, select this at nine. And get a better feel for my arc. All right. Now the other thing I'm kind of looking at is I feel like at one, 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 it probably still should have a touch of rotation into it, right? I feel like it's resolving that rotation just a little, a little too quick. So if that's true, I can come down here to one of my other rotates. So rotate X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> and I can choose to add in just a touch of those. Now, honestly, I would probably not do it in my graph editor. I would just do it in my scene. I would add in just a wee bit of rotation. Something like that, maybe. Set that guy. All right, so next thing we're going to do is go to the peak. Peak is 15. Go over here. I'm going to look at this translate Y. I don't, I still don't like how flat this curve is. I would like it to gain a little more height. So I'm just going to grab 15. I'm going to pull this guy up just a wee bit. And maybe I want this to hold a little height for a little bit longer, right? Okay, I got one. Yeah, let's bring this up just a wee bit. And then what I'm gonna do is start to adjust this curve. So in order to do so, one, I'm gonna give myself a little more viewable space here. I'm also gonna change the properties of my ghost. 
real quick. Visualize. Go selected. I'm going to take this. I'm going to say step size of two. So I didn't have to change any major calculations. I'm still seeing four ghosts on each side or four and five, whatever. But <clears throat> now I'm skipping a frame essentially in between each one. So I see a longer chunk of uh, my arc. And that's what actually what I'm trying to find right now is a really nice arc. So if I come into this particular dude, let me close this. I can right click on my tangent <clears throat> the intersection here and I can do a few things. The first thing I want to do is break my tangent. So what does that mean? Well, if I come in and I select one of these handles, notice that it changes all of my curve at the same time, right? If you guys if you guys all had 221 where you use uh, Adobe Illustrator yet? Yeah. I'm in it right now. Oh, you guys are in it right now? Yeah. Okay. I know they're co-rex. Some people have it early, some people don't. So it, it, I'm guessing you guys haven't gotten to Illustrator yet. No. Uh, yeah, I think we're supposed to do that. Probably it's like week, maybe or something. Yeah, probably. Not. I say it, okay. Uh, okay. So uh, basically, there's a thing called a pen tool in Illustrator. It works similar to this, and you're using math to figure out an arc. So since you guys haven't had Illustrator, I won't uh, use that analogy. OK. So nonetheless, we can see that it moves both sides of this spline here, right? So if I break this, right click, come down, and say Break Tangents, notice that my icon here went from a solid line with a triangle to a dotted line with a triangle. The dotted line means that it's a broken tangent, all right? Also means I can now grab and move one side at a time, right? Which is pretty handy when you need it. Now, the next thing I want is to add weight to these tangents, right? That means I can pull them out and lift them up and down to really get, uh, let's say this peak, let's say I wanted to have a little more hang time at the top, right? So I right click the tangent, I come down here and say weighted tangents. Now it's gonna change it to a square, right? So square means that it's weighted. The dotted line means it's broken. So now I can come in here and grab these dudes and pull to the outside and move up. So notice, that this is going to widen the peak of my hang time. Now I'm going to hold shift. Shift used to snap this thing. Apparently that's not turned on right now. So I'm going to widen this out. I'm trying to keep this bar pretty flat. What I don't want is to have it like this. Right? Oops. If I have something like this, my ball is going to make an unnatural arc. It's going to find a peak and then shoot back over. And that's just because you were sloppy in how you dealt with your graph editor, right? Believe it or not, this is entire career right here. There are people in the animation profession who literally get uh, a basic animation from somebody and their entire job is diving into a graph editor and cleaning it up and make it look amazing. It's not the most exciting job in the world unless that's what you're into, but you know, it would definitely be a good step in. Okay, into the door. Okay. Hmm. It could be neat. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it'd be kind of fun. Would it be tedious? Yes. But to be honest, there's not much in 3D that isn't without a, a touch of tedium. You have to kind of embrace it. Okay. What time do we get out of here? Okay. Let's see. All right. So now I'm widening out that, that peak 
just a bit. And because I've widened that out, look at my curve here. See how that's not a continuous arc? It kind of finds a lump. There's like this strange spline action going on there. So I can fix that a couple of different ways. I could highlight this thing and come over here and call it uh, linear. So if I go to tangents, I come down here and call this guy linear. And it would do something like that. Now clearly that didn't give me the result I was hoping for, right? So I just hit Z. I'm gonna come down here. I'm going to break my tangent. And fix this guy. So that it feels more round, more smooth. All right. Now, I know what you're, you're thinking right now. You're thinking, man, this is going to take a lot of time. I don't have time because, dang on it, Bremer. I've got five other classes that I've got to deal with this semester. I ain't got time to be piddling around with these things. Well, it's only going to take a while the first time or two that you do this. After that, you start being able to think inside the graph editor, and it goes a whole lot faster. All right. So I would say take the time, learn what you're doing now, and it's going to pay off in the end. All right. So now I think I'm relatively happy with this as it is. I haven't fixed the landing point yet like I did the, the takeoff point, but you would do that exact same thing. But do the time, so we have like two minutes left. Uh, you get the point. It's a rinse and repeat. You just go through, you clean up the takeoff or the liftoff, go to the landing, make sure you're moving that where the feet land should be the center point of that squash, right? So as it's coming down, the center point should hit and then the whole ball should squat down into that landing squash and then take off again from that, that position. So you're gonna have to adjust those X, Y, and Z translations a little bit to get them closer to that landing point, all right? So now we come in, we turn the ghosting off, turn that off. I would say that looks a whole lot nicer. Just a little bit of adjustment. Let me put this back to one. Save it. It's fine to preview this thing at half, but always make sure you go back to times one and see what it's gonna look like for real. Cool. Questions on that?